time for overtime. Stop what you're doing and listen. In the world of sports, it's all about the playmakers in today's headlines, from locals to the pros, with interviews from local standouts and sports all-stars across the country that will have you talking. He'll shoot and he hits it! Hear from coaches to players, sports analysts, and broadcasters who are a part of the action every day. Overtime, now with Burt Ramin on ESPN 102.3 AM 1000 KSOO, Sioux Falls Sports Leader. Welcome in to the Monday edition of Overtime. What a weekend. We got the best weather. We had Cinco de Mayo. We had Star Wars Saturday, the Kentucky Derby, and the Minnesota Timberwolves are here to stay. My goodness, what a win in game number one. Game two on the way tonight. And the national media has taken notice of what we have long known. Anthony Edwards is a rising and continuing to rise star. And, of course, you got Carl Anthony Towns, Rudy Gobert. It's all coming together for the Timberwolves. And they are a still a small dog tonight on the road in Denver for game two. But if... They beat Denver tonight, and I mean if. I don't think it's likely just because Denver has to win this game. If they win and take a 2-0 series lead with both wins coming on the road, I think the sports world might rip in half as we gear it up for the Tuesday edition tomorrow. We got game two from Denver tonight, and so much to recap here with you as we crank up another work week here on Overtime. Thanks, as always, for spending some time with us right here on ESPN 102.3 AM 1000 KSOO. On today's uh, week-starting edition of the show, we'll be talking about Mark Grinowski. We'll be talking about South Dakota State FCS football. If there is an upward trajectory and trend regarding FCS players making their way to the NFL through the NFL draft, Sam Herter, senior FCS analyst with Hero Sports, will join us in about 20 minutes to lead off the week of the program. We'll also give you the latest on the Timberwolves, check in on the odds across the NBA, and some keys for tonight's Game 2 showdown from Denver. We'll be talking New York Jets, Aaron Rodgers, and a couple marketable rookies that they landed in the draft, including Isaiah Davis, Braylon Allen, Malachi Corley, and in my opinion, the most underrated quarterback in the NFL draft this season, that is Florida State's Jordan Travis, and why he couldn't have landed in a better place. We'll talk with Jake Asman of the Jake Asman Show, ESPN New York, and a contributor with Mad Dog Sports Radio to round out our number one. Jake will be hitting the air with us around 1140 ish hour number two highlights and headlines will get you your history lesson to uh, kick off the work week with a little on this day in sports history and we'll recap the kentucky derby which posted some very impressive numbers in another great race there for number 150 from churchill downs it was a photo finish of three different horses nascar also had their closest finish in the history of the sport at least electronically NASCAR big race over the weekend, the Kentucky Derby. We'll recap it all around 1230 and we'll finish it out today on the Monday edition of Overtime with the good, the bad and the ugly. Now into your scorecard. First things first, as we get it going on this work week, on this May, or excuse me, May 6th edition of Overtime. Let's talk hockey first as a series came to a close and a series led off last night. First things first, Carolina and the Rangers tussled from New York, where New York off to a good start and a one nothing series lead. Wait, three seconds to go, and this one is over. Rangers win it. Rangers win it 4-3 in game number one. Audio there courtesy of 98.7 ESPN New York. Other series, it was a fun one, and somebody had to say so long, and somebody had to move along. The, the Las Vegas and Dallas from Dallas last night. It was game seven, and it was the Stars that end up moving on to the next round. Now Radic Foxa had position on Martinez. Leaves it for Smith. Back for Fox. It was in his skates. Back in. He scored. Radic Foxa. And the Stars would not surrender that lead. 2-1 was the final. Dallas moving on to the next round. They win the series four games to three. Here's head coach Pete DeBoer. We wanted our turn. Uh, you know, we felt we did all the right things all year in order to get the first seed. And then, you you know, you draw a team like Vegas, which, you know, I honestly think they, they've got a deeper team than they had last year. So, um, you know, and, and, and 
to plow through the adversity of being down to nothing and just uh, there's a lot there to unpack. Certainly a lot to unpack moving forward in the NHL postseason. Tonight in the NHL, Bruins at Panthers game one from Florida, 7 o'clock on ESPN. That's the lone game going on tonight. Tomorrow, Hurricanes and Rangers do it again from New York for game two, 6 o'clock on ESPN. Also tomorrow night, Avalanche at Stars get going from Dallas with game one, 8.30 puck drop on ESPN. NBA Saturday night, Minnesota reigns supreme on the national stage. 106-99 win in game one in Denver. Anthony Edwards 43 points. Jokic nearly a triple-double, but not enough as Minnesota takes down Denver in Game 1. That final from Saturday night, 106-99. to Yesterday, things came to a close for Cleveland and Orlando with Game number 7. Magic impressed a lot of folks, including yours truly in the postseason start. They take it to seven games, but Cleveland wins the series 106-94, the final in Game 7. Donovan Mitchell, 39 points and 9 rebounds, and he says, hey, we can still be better than this moving forward. This was great because we were able to learn a lot of things about ourselves. You know, I'm never going to shy away from that, but, you know, we can be better. You know what I mean? And I I hate to be that guy, but, like, you know, this was great. This was phenomenal as as a a great win, great series, great test for us mentally, physically. But, you know, we can and we will have to be better to beat beat Boston. No disrespect to Orlando because they are a phenomenal team. they got a lot of great guys. Donovan Mitchell there, 39 points in the win, 106-94 yesterday. That propels Cleveland on to a second-round matchup against the Boston Celtics. Tonight in the NBA, Pacers at Knicks, game one, 6-30 on TNT. Chris Canty says it would be a big-time failure if the Knicks don't win this series against the Pacers. I am fully expecting the New York Knicks to get to the Eastern Conference Finals. Anything less is not just a disappointment, it's a failure. I think if that the, argument If the New York Knicks don't get to the Eastern Conference Finals, after the series that they just came out of, after the draw that they're going to get in the second round as opposed to the alternative, they damn well better get to the Eastern Conference Finals. This is a situation now, if you're the New York Knicks, after that war that you just got out of with the Sixers, if you can't find your way to the Conference Finals, it has to be viewed as a failure. Co-sign on that 100%. Knicks open up the series. Game one tonight, 6.30 on TNT against the Pacers. Timberwolves and Nuggets game two tonight, 9 o'clock on TNT. You got to stay up late, but it's definitely worth the show. Speaking of a show, no one playing better than Anthony Edwards these days, according to Brian Windhorst. Playing better, maybe not. I mean, Brunson has probably had the best playoffs so far. Okay. But Ant is right there. Jokic is right there. And the thing about Ant is that he plays both ends of the court. They are the number one defensive team, partially because Ant works hard on that end. He is 6'4", with extremely long arms, and works his tail off on offense, does the whole, or on defense, does the whole thing with a smile, is not afraid of big shots, explosive player. This is a guy that is as exciting as a player as we've seen in the NBA, coming into the NBA in a while and definitely is the future face of the league. It may have been tough to say before the series started, but people are starting to come around. It's easy to say now that the Timberwolves are up again. They stole one on the road in game number one. Game two, five and a half point spread as of right now in favor of the Denver Nuggets. But Stephen A. Smith is one of many saying Timberwolves could be up for the challenge of landing the monumental upset and winning the series in Denver. I got Anthony Edwards and the Minnesota Timberwolves winning this series. I mean, I've seen enough. This brother is some, he is so sensational, it's hard to put into words. This brother is the truth and a half. He is the real deal. Absolutely is the real deal. Again, Anthony Edwards game one, 43 points and seven rebounds. Minnesota won on Saturday night, 106 to 99. I don't think they're winning tonight, and I don't think that's a hot take at all. I think that Denver will come back and show why they are. The best team in the NBA playoffs remaining, and they will win against the Minnesota Timberwolves, and Minnesota will have to fight tooth and nail. Do I think the Timberwolves can win the series? I absolutely do. That game one win was huge, absolutely huge for the confidence of the Timberwolves, the tone setting of the series, and everything that goes along with that. Confidence at an all-time high for Minnesota. I don't think they're winning tonight, but certainly a loss tonight does not really really uh, put them to bed in terms of winning the series because they got two games at home coming up in due time. I still like the Timberwolves' chances, but I think Denver back on the right track tonight. Again, 9 o'clock on TNT. Minnesota leads that series one game to none. Major League Baseball finals yesterday. Colorado continues to struggle. They lost to Pittsburgh on the road yesterday 5-3. Rockies are 8-26. and Cubbies up and down this year, but oh, more up than down lately. They moved to 21-14 and with a 5-0 win over rival Milwaukee yesterday at Wrigley. 
Deep drive to left center off the bat of Swanson. It's got a chance. Gone. Dansby Swanson with a line drive home run to left center. And the Cubs now lead 4 to nothing. 5 nothing. the final yesterday. Chicago 21-14. Audio there courtesy of WSCR. Other finals, Yankees over the Tigers 5-2. Cleveland wins yesterday over the Angels 4-1. to The AL Central leading Guardians continue to lead the uh, division 22-12. Their record, Boston ends a 12-game win streak for the Minnesota Twins yesterday. Here's some audio from yesterday's win. Lopsided affair in the Red Sox victory. Devers drives one high and deep in a right field. It's way back. It is gone. He does eat Devers. His fourth home run of the year, and it is 9 2. Red Sox. Joe Ryan takes the loss, and the Twins take a loss for the first time in their last 13 games. That audio, W-E-E-I. Other games to recap, Texas wins in Kansas City 3-2, and the White Sox earn their eighth win of the season, winning in St. Louis 5-1 over the Cardinals. Today and tonight in Major League Baseball, Tigers at Guardians, AL Central Showdown. You can watch it on Fox Sports 1 at 5-10. White Sox at Rays 5-50, Brewers at Royals, Padres at Cubs, Mets at Cardinals, a few other games. Twins are home to Seattle, 6 o'clock pregame, 640, the official start time. Now a look at your entire American League standings here on a Monday. AL East, it's the Orioles atop, just ahead of the Yankees. One game better, Baltimore 23-11. and 11. Yankees are 23-13. and 13. Red Sox in third place at 19-16, and 16, followed by the Rays and Blue Jays out in the East. Out to our West, the AL West. It's the Mariners, a half game better than the Rangers right now, 19-15. and 15. Rangers are 19-16, and 16, followed by Oakland in third place. Houston has crawled just a little bit out of the basement. They're tied for last place with the Angels' identical records of 12 and 22. And lastly, your AL Central standings. The Twins' win streak has vaulted them from fourth in the division all the way up to second in the division. Two and a half games back of Cleveland. Cleveland is 22 and 12. Minnesota 19 and 14. Kansas City 20 and 15. Their record identical uh, win percentage and games back from the top spot. Tigers right there, four games back at 18 and 16. And the Chicago White Sox in the cellar of the AL Central with a mark of 8 and 26. No big NFL news over the weekend. We talked to you about the veteran wide receiver signings as we led into that Friday portion of the weekend, but it was a big weekend in the race scene. NASCAR, Kyle Larson won at Kansas in the closest finish ever in the history of NASCAR, besting Chris Buescher at the checkered flag. Chase Elliott was third. Next race for NASCAR, Darlington on Sunday, 2 o'clock on Fox Sports 1. PGA Tour Golf, Taylor Pendrith with his first win on the tour, wins the CJ Cup, Byron Nelson from McKinney, Texas, with a score of 23 under par. Next up this weekend, Thursday through Sunday, the Wells Fargo Championship gets going from Charlotte, North Carolina. And last but most certainly not least, I know I tuned in, the family was hooping and hollering. We had some fun for the 150th running of the Kentucky Derby. Here's the recap of a very memorable 150th running. A photo finish for Kentucky Derby 150. And once the dust cleared, it was Mystic Dan by a nose, literally, to take the 150th running of the Kentucky Derby. The time of the race, just over two minutes and three seconds. The trainer is Louisville-based Kenny McPeak. Well, it's been a lot, a lot of long days, and, you know, it's never been easy. Seems like, um, you know, even tomorrow morning we got, we've got we got work to do. But, um, yeah, it's pretty darn special. Over 150,000 fans packed into historic Churchill Downs to take in the milestone running of the Derby. At the 150th running of the Kentucky Derby, Will Clark, ABC Sports. Mystic Dan, your winner, followed by Sierra Leone, Forever Young, Catching Freedom, and T.O. Password. Resilience, who was one of the favorites, finished in sixth overall in the top ten. Seventh was Stronghold, eighth was Honor Marie, Endlessly was ninth, and Dornock comes in at 10th at the 150th running of the Kentucky Derby. Now into your Reliabank headlines of the day here. Monday edition of Overtime, fifth inning, two RBI home run, 
followed up by a walk-off three-run bomb from Kennedy Buckman, secured the NSIC championship for the Augustana Vikings softball team in a 9-0 win over Minnesota Duluth on Saturday afternoon. The Vikings secured their spot in the NCAA tournament and will await their opponent in Monday's selection show. Grace Glanzer pitched three uh, three hitter six inning complete game while striking out nine to move her record to 23 and three on the season. Augustana outscored its opponents 20 to nothing. Throughout the tournament, Glanzer struck out 18 batters in three appearances in helping the Vikings move their record to 45 and 13 on the season. Can't wait to keep following along with Augustana softball. USF Cougar football head coach Jim Glagowski excited to announce the addition of a pair of transfers over the weekend. Kendis Ledbetter and Bo Giblin. Ledbetter's the defensive lineman, joins the coup program following a season at Concordia St. Paul. As for Giblin, he's a safety. He returns to Sioux Falls after spending his freshman season at South Dakota State as a member of the FCS National Championship Program. Prior to South Dakota State, Giblin led the defense at Jefferson High School while helping lead the Cavaliers to a state title back in 2022. More on those pair of additions at usfcougars.com. Speaking of Augustana, the baseball team continues their romp through the remainder of the regular season. 12th rated Augustana baseball concluded their best regular season in program History with a 12 and 12 to 2 win in seven innings over Minot State on Saturday afternoon at Ronkin Field. Vikings finished the regular season 41 and 8. They beat the 2018 team program record of 40 and 8 for a record in the regular season. They also end the year as the NSIC regular season champions with a 32 and 6 conference mark. And the Beavers conclude the season after the loss at 15 and 34, 12 and 27 in conference play. Up next for Augustana Viking baseball, they're now gearing up for the conference tournament. The NSIC tournament this year will be up in Bismarck. They'll take on NSIC 8th seed at noon on Wednesday in their first game from the NSIC tournament. Again, for more on softball, baseball for Augustana, you know the place to go. It's goaugie.com. South Dakota State, or South Dakota rather, men's basketball has announced another transfer addition, adding Chase Forte to the upcoming roster. Forte is a six foot four senior guard from Northwestern State. Forte spent last season at Northwestern State where he made 29 starts over 32 games and averaged 10 points, four rebounds, three assists, and two steals per game as a junior for the Demons. Raleigh, North Carolina native, spent two seasons at Gulf Coast State and one season at UNC Asheville prior to his time at Northwestern State. So it's going to be his fourth program in his college career. And again, the latest addition to USD Coyote men's basketball, Chase Forte of Northwestern State via a transfer. South Dakota State struggles against Northern Colorado on the baseball diamond continued yesterday with the Bears completing a three-game sweep of the Summit League Baseball Series by posting a 14-6 victory yesterday afternoon. In also finishing off a sweep of the season series, UNC improved to 12-32-1 and 11-12-1 and in the Summit League. Jackrabbits dropped to 17-25 and and fell down to 9-13 in conference play. UNC scored the final 10 runs of the contest after the Jackrabbits held a 6-4 to lead through five and a half innings, but unfortunately Jackrabbits on the wrong side there. Coming up next, the Jackrabbits continue their road trip with a matchup today at Air Force. Start time is set for 1 o'clock Mountain Time, 2 o'clock Central at Ertle Field on the Air Force Academy campus near Colorado Springs. South Dakota defeated North Dakota State uh, 9-3 in the final game of the three-game series in Vermilion over the weekend. The Yotes took the first strike of the morning when Autumn Iverson doubled to bring in Alexis Terrazas. Gabby Moser hit a double prior to that to send Alexia to third base and set up the score, giving the Yotes a one to nothing lead in the bottom of the second inning. Again, South Dakota took down North Dakota State 9-3, final game of the three-game series yesterday in Vermilion. Coming up next, the Summit League Tournament begins on Wednesday of this week up in Brookings for as Summit League softball. They're going to test my wits on this name pronunciation, but South Dakota women's basketball coach Carrie Amy is pleased to announce the signing of Vicky Matula Vicious to a national letter of intent. A combo guard from the suburbs of Chicago in Willowbrook, Illinois. Matula Vicious was a two-time MVP and four-time All-Girls Catholic Athletic Conference honoree for Montini Catholic High School. And another addition there, she joins Hannah Coons, Ava Cassette, and Gabby Wilkie in the incoming freshman class for USD Coyote 
women's basketball. Those are your Reliant Bank headlines of the day for our number one. When we come back, let's talk about the state of FCS college football. Mark Granowski is officially coming back to lead the Jackrabbit program again in a quest for a three-peat for South Dakota State Jackrabbit football. We'll talk about that. We'll talk about the state of the draftability of FCS college football players and much, much more. Sam Herter, senior FCS analyst with Hero Sports, joins us next on this Monday edition of Overtime. College hoops and NBA basketball, the NFL and Major League Baseball. It's all here on ESPN 102.3 and AM 1000 KSOO, Sioux Falls Sports Leader. been running on the Monday edition of Overtime. Thanks for tuning us in as always right here on ESPN 102.3 AM 1000 KSOO. We're a ways away from the FCS college football season rolling around, but always love to spotlight our area programs up there in Brookings, South Dakota State, down in Vermilion, USD. Here to break down the FCS, the latest there, the transfers in, the transfers out, the guys making the jump to the NFL via the draft or an undrafted free agency. Sam Herter, our guest now on the ESPN Hotline, senior FCS analyst at Hero Sports. Sam, I know it was a busy time of the year, but I hope you're taking a little bit of time to relax now that the draft is in the rear view how you doing hey i'm doing good uh, always good to join you talk some fcs and yeah it's it's may right now so things are a little slow but uh you know, certainly preparing and prepping for some preseason material which is always fun to start to look uh, ahead to the upcoming season yeah, hope abounds for all the programs out there across college football whether it be the fbs level the fcs level d2 d3 and beyond uh, let's talk about the nfl draft because there were a lot of draftable and drafted guys from the fcs level on the broad scope of things as you kind of zoom out and just look at the overall numbers how would you paint the picture for the FCS and making the transition to the National Football League? Are those numbers of guys nationally from the FCS ranks going to the NFL via the draft? Are those numbers growing? Are they staying pretty flat or are they going down? What do you think? The numbers are down a bit compared to the 2010s. Um, yeah, I think during the 2010s, the average number of draft picks per year from the FCS was like 16 or 17. Um, it's been down this year. Is, it has been 12. Last year was 11. Uh, a couple of years ago was 24. And so the number kind of jumps around uh, all over the place. But the 12 draft picks this year is, is kind of, um, I, I guess it is down from the previous average from the previous decade. But I, I think you're seeing that in the NFL draft. A lot of these teams are spending their draft picks on power five players, um, knowing they can get group of five and FCS guys through undrafted free agent contracts. Uh, I think there was only... 18 group of five players drafted and so that's not much more than uh than the 12 fcs draft picks and then that leaves 200 plus from the power five leagues and i i just think there's so much depth of talents uh at the power five level i mean there were first team all big 10 and, and and second team all sec players getting drafted in the seventh round um and those guys were standout players at their sec schools and they were dropping all the way to the seventh round uh but on the bright side there were 62 fcs players that got undrafted free agent deals um you know, another uh, close to 100 uh, players are getting uh, rookie minicamp invites. So um, there, there's still plenty of FCS guys getting opportunities in the NFL, uh, in the uh, to the NFL, just just not going the route of the NFL draft. Sam, I wanted to ask you, though, as you dive into those numbers a little bit, of course, all that anybody really knows, especially on draft day, is they hear that great chime ding and it says Jared Verse, Florida State, right? Do the numbers that you're referencing kind of take into account where people started their college career? Because in the case of Verse, he was at Albany. Does the FCS program get credit in your numbers for that player being drafted, or is it just where they finish college? No, so there's there's like no official way technically to you know what what counts as an FCS draft pick or what doesn't. There's no you know official official method out there. But what I've done and what other uh, outlets that cover the FCS have done is. Um, if a player plays multiple years in the FCS and then they transfer and play their last year in the FBS and then they get drafted, we're going to count those players as draft picks from the FCS. So a, an example this year, um, offensive lineman uh, Nick Gargulia, uh, he, he played 
three or four years at Yale, and then he grad transferred to South Carolina uh, yep. this last year and played one season in the FBS. He got drafted. You know, I, I think the FCS slash Yale deserves to kind of quote unquote count him as a draft pick from the FCS. But then there are are guys like the defensive player from U Albany. You played a couple of years in the FCS, uh, then Verse, he played, I think, two years in, uh, at Florida State. Uh, a guy like that won't count uh, as an FCS draft pick. And so um, if you play multiple years in the FBS, we're not going to count you. But if you play multiple years in the FCS and then play one year for your last year in the FBS, uh, we'll count you as a draft pick. Very interesting stuff. Again, just movers and shakers across the college football world in regards to the individual players, the teams, the programs, the conferences. Everything seems to be changing minute by minute uh, in college football. Talking with Sam Herter, senior FCS analyst at Hero Sports. Let's talk about the guys close to home. Uh, There were three total drafted. Isaiah Davis, Mason McCormick uh, for South Dakota State, and then Miles Harden for USD. I was a big fan, just player matching up to uh, to landing spot with McCormick going to Pittsburgh. You know, that gritty, uh, rough and tough, run the football, physicality. Was that your favorite landing spot among the three with Harden going to Cleveland and Davis going uh, to the New York Jets? Or did you have a, a more favorite landing spot for an FCS prospect? Yeah, the McCormick one, he definitely fits in at Pittsburgh. And so that's the one that, that stands out the most. It's hard to to kind of tell what the other guy, like, I don't know the, I'll be honest. I don't really know the New York Jets a whole lot. You know, I don't, I don't, yep. I don't know what their roster is. So I don't know what their running back uh, situation is like. Same thing with the Browns and um, you know, the, the defensive backfield uh, for them, but you know, just knowing Mason McCormick and how he plays kind of that gritty, gritty, tough attitude about him. That obviously fits the Pittsburgh Steelers uh, pretty well. So that, that's one that uh, definitely pops off the page. You know, I also think that Dylan Lobb, he's a running back from New Hampshire, I mean, he's a guy, he's a running back, but he can catch it. He can return it. Uh, He lands at the Raiders. Uh, It'll be interesting to see if they, you know, view him as a guy that they can utilize in a lot of different ways, whether it's running the ball, you know, uh, passing the ball to him. Um, You know, he's electric in the kick return and punt return. (laughs) And so you can get the ball uh, in his hands in a multitude of ways and he'll make plays. And so that, that is one guy that I'm interested to see how the Raiders utilize him. And it's very interesting. A lot of opportunities, whether you're drafted, undrafted, try out in between for FCS, NAIA, D3, D2 football across the board. Sam Herter, our guest here again, Monday edition of Overtime. I wanted to ask you about the transfer portal because when it comes to mind of FCS fans, it's a negative, but that's not always the case. And you had posted earlier today about some transfers into the FCS ranks from guys that transfer from FBS schools. So it works both ways. Obviously, you have the poaching concerns. We saw it with Tucker Craig a few years ago we saw it with Mark Gronowski this offseason although he's coming back which is huge news for that program and for FCS college football but the transfer portal generally looks like a negative but talk to us about the positive side and the guys that are opting to come down if you will to the FCS level from FBS because it does work both ways right it does yeah there's you know, usually a give and take to, to these type of things. You can, you know, say the same thing about NIL. There's some negatives and some positives. And with the transfer portal, looking at it through an FCS lens, the portal is, is negative in the obvious ways, right? You know, it's easier for, uh, it's easier for FCS standouts to go to the FBS compared to a few years ago. There's, there's really no restrictions um, anymore. You can, you can jump up and play instead of having to, to sit out a year. Um, but still, you know, a vast majority of FCS all-conference players still return uh, to their team. And so it's not like once a player, you know, becomes a standout at the FCS level, he's automatically going to go to the FBS uh, more often than not. The standouts are staying in the FCS, but there's still, you know, maybe a hundred or so FCS all conference players um, leaving for the FBS, which seems like, which seems like a lot, but there's also hundreds more uh, FCS standouts staying with their team. And then you also, like you said, you know, it goes both ways. There's a lot of FBS guys who, couldn't, uh, couldn't find playing time at their previous FBS school, um, and then they transfer uh, down to uh, the FCS. And so the FCS, you know, like I said, negatively has been impacted by the uh, by the transfer portal, but also there's some positives where there are some um, some highly talented guys that just couldn't get on the field at the FBS level. They're coming down. And then I've also heard from coaches too that because the FBS programs are recruiting the transfer portal so much, they're spending less scholarships on guys out of high school, and so you know, Boise State three-star linebacker, you know, a, a guy that would usually go to Boise State, uh, he's no longer going there because that scholarship isn't available. So all of a sudden that three-star recruit out of Utah goes to Montana State instead of or, or Weber State instead of Boise State. And so um, that's, that's another side of the positive of the, of the transfer portal is 
Um, I've heard coaches say that the level of high school recruit that the FCS is getting uh, ha- has never been, um, you know, stronger th- than it is right now because the FBS is spending less scholarships on uh, on high school guys. And so there is a there is a, a positive there from a high school report uh, recruiting perspective. Uh, but now <laughs> it's a matter of keeping that that uh, that standout high school recruit for multiple years. That, that's the other challenge of it. Very good point there. Again, it's kind of a yin and yang, give and take. A lot more take than, uh, or a lot more give than take right now for the FCS from their perspective, but still still working on navigating the new climate in college football. Lastly, on the transfer portal, Mark Gronowski back with South Dakota State. Obviously, any time a player gets really, really darn good at a premier FCS program, their fans are worried and anxious that they might lose them to a jump in the transfer portal. Different program, better opportunity, perhaps. Gronowski back with South Dakota State. Walter Payton, uh, uh Award winner this past year. How big of a deal is that? And what do you think it says for the future of FCS college football that they can retain their top players? Yeah, I think South Dakota State uh, overall has, you know, maybe set the, um, you know, perhaps hopefully, I guess I should say, you know, set a precedent of if, if you are a star FCS player, um, you don't need to go to the FBS to improve your draft stock. And in, in fact, you know, you have the Jared Burst example, right? Going from FCS to Florida State, getting drafted in, in the first round. But that's really, really rare, actually. There actually hasn't been a whole lot of FCS to FBS transfers that have gotten drafted. The number of just uh, guys that have gotten drafted straight out of the FCS is still uh, quite a bit more than FCS to FBS transfers. Um, and so we've seen that with, uh, you know, Isaiah Davis, you know, Mason McCormick. Um, you know, Tucker Kraft a couple of years ago, all those guys were probably getting some NIL offers to go to, the, to a, a power five program and they stayed put. They had an all American season. They won a national championship and, and, and they got drafted. And so um, the proof was right there that you don't have to make the jump to improve your draft stock. Um, and now with Mark Gronowski, is, is he an NFL draft pick? You know, I, I don't know. Um, I don't have, you know, that type of type of eye to project FCS guys to the next level. Um, but I did hear him say that, uh, a part of his decision was what was going to be best for his draft stock. And he said, he talked to some folks in the know that saying that South Dakota state wasn't going to hurt his draft stock. And if anything, it could help uh, his draft stock because he can, you know, just, just hone in on, on his, on his craft, um, continue to dominate at the FCS level. And at the end of the day, what scouts want to see is you produce no matter where you're at. Um, they want to see you produce. And there's always a risk of being an FCS standout and, going to the FBS level and becoming a role player and not playing a whole lot. And even though your talent is the same, if you're not, if you, if you can't produce at your new FBS school, you know, it's going to be, it's going to be a hard time to navigate your way to the NFL. And so um, I think for a lot of these guys staying at the FCS level um, and dominating and, and, and just playing and producing, uh, you're better off doing that than going to the FBS and perhaps risking being, you know, instead of an All-American FCS running back, now you're the third running back at, at, at a Big Ten school. That, that's a risk that a lot of these guys are taking by transferring up. Definitely true. Sam Herter, Senior FCS Analyst at Hero Sports, our guest. Monday edition of Overtime. Sam, lastly, before I let you go, we're in the heart of the off season, so it's pretty hard to tell. But give me two programs from uh, coast to coast, the FCS level. I know we're spoiled here in South Dakota with USD and South Dakota State up the road. But talk to us about a couple programs nationwide that you've got your eye on heading into 2024 as a team that uh, is ready to make that jump. Yeah, I think the the big four are going to remain the big four, South Dakota State, North Dakota State, Montana, Montana State. Um, I think those four are kind of in a tier uh, of themselves heading into this year. But, you know, I think Idaho, coached by Jason Eck, of course, I think they're going to be uh, pretty dang good as, you know, maybe the the number six team. Um, Toronto to top five, I would put South Dakota um, in there uh, in the top five. So it's going to be it's going to be pretty Big Sky heavy, Missouri Valley Football Conference heavy as far as those top teams. But, you know, looking behind, uh, beyond those two conferences, uh, I think Central Arkansas has a pretty good chance to, to take a huge step forward. Um, they got a lot of uh, talented guys coming back. Their quarterback, a couple of good running backs. David Walker is, is a really good defensive end for them. Uh, I think Villanova is going to be tough again. Uh, they gave South Dakota State a pretty good game in the playoffs, and they're always going to be tough, hard-nosed defensively. Uh, they also have their quarterback back, Hunter Watkins, and so I think they'll be – They'll be some, somewhere there uh, in the in the top ten, uh, I would say. So those are uh, a couple of teams um, outside of the Big Sky Valley that uh, I think could 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 make a little bit of noise. We're a ways away, but already looking forward to the 2024 FCS college football season. We'll chat with you again here soon, sometime in the off season as we creep closer to kickoff. Sam, thanks so much for the time as always, my friend.
All right, sounds good. Thank you. All right, that's Sam Herter, senior FCS analyst at Hero Sports. And again, that's exactly what we're doing as we're in the early portions of May. We're just creeping and crawling our way, folks. And again, if you want to get excited, South Dakota State has earned that spot, the top dog in the FCS, but they're up there in that big four, South Dakota State, North Dakota State, Montana, Montana State, and he did mention USD in the top five, so gear up, buckle up for another great season of FCS college football. Sam Herter, our guest then, coming up next, we'll go right to the phone lines once again. It's going to be a chat about the New York Jets, about Aaron Rodgers, the NFL draft, and much, much more. One of our favorites, Jake Asman of ESPN New York, joins us next on the ESPN Hotline. Line. It's the Monday edition of Overtime right here on ESPN Sioux Falls. All states. The Mops and coverage. We are ESPN 102.3 and AM 1000 KSOO, Sioux Falls sports leader. Right back with you. It's the Monday edition of Overtime. You ever miss any of the show? You can always listen back. Podcast links available, ESPNSuFalls.com and on that free ESPN Sioux Falls mobile app. Here to break down the NFL draft, talk about his New York Jets, and so much more is Jake Asman of the Jake Asman Show, ESPN New York, also on the air with Mad Dog Sports Radio. He's a busy guy, year in and year out, a lot going on. But Jake, as we welcome you into the show, I got a question for you, man, because this time of year, some people will say it's a desert in the sports world, but I disagree. You got the Kentucky Derby, you got the Indy 500 upcoming, NBA posts season, NHL postseason, NFL draft. If I had to guarantee you just one of those events to watch year in and year out, you can lump the Masters in there if you want to. Which one event are you choosing and why? Man, that's a tough question because I'm a huge football fan, of course, so I do love the draft every year, but yep. I'm also a diehard Knicks fan, and the Knicks are in the <laughs> second round in consecutive years for the first time in 25 years, so I'm not used to, like, you know, the Knicks actually being in the mix two straight seasons, so I think I'd go NBA playoffs. I'll be at the Garden tonight for game one of the Eastern Conference semifinals against the Pacers. So as a huge Knicks fan who's waited basically my entire life for this team to be relevant, I'm going to go with the NBA playoffs. And it's a very exciting time. And a lot of people, Chris Canty, we played that clip earlier saying that it would be a colossal disappointment if the Knicks don't advance past the series against Indiana. A lot to look forward to there. Uh, let's talk hockey real quick, too, because I know the Islanders uh, and the Rangers both in the mix in the postseason. But where do you stand on that particular choice between those two franchises? Are you a hockey guy? I am a hockey guy. Unfortunately, I'm an Islander fan, though. Gotcha. So I don't get to truly enjoy this uh, Rangers run. That's going on right now, and they're, they're certainly in the mix, you know, to actually win their first Stanley Cup since Mark Messier and that '94 Rangers team. But it's kind of reminiscent of '94 in New York right now. You know, the Knicks are in the second round, the Rangers are in the second round. If you remember in '94, both teams went all the way to the finals, and OJ Simpson was in the news then too. And here we are, 30 years later, he's in the news again, and the Knicks and Rangers are championship contenders. So it's it's kind of full circle 30 years later in a way which is crazy must be a sign lastly on that topic of the new york sports scene i gotta ask you this question because fandom runs really deep and i know you're a jets guy i know you're a knicks guy and you just mentioned you're an islanders fan as well how much does it take or will it ever take uh, will you ever end up rooting for the other new york team or maybe the team down in brooklyn in the nba will you ever root for them if your team is out and they're on a big stage I couldn't do it personally. I know there's some who do. I just think if you're a fan, you have your team, and that's it. But that's also, to your point, what makes this Knicks run so unique. You know, I've seen some people say, oh, why are Knicks fans celebrating? Why are they going so crazy after winning a first-round series? And I just don't think people realize that the magnitude of the Knicks fan base in New York. If you think about it, New York has two baseball teams. The fan base is split. they got three hockey teams. The fan base is split. Two football teams. So the fan base is split. Yes, the Nets are a thing. But we're talking maybe 5 10% of the tri-state area being Brooklyn Nets fans. So you're talking about the Knicks fan base that, that really reaches 90% of the entire area. It's like in Boston, everyone is a Celtics, Patriots, Red Sox, Bruins fan. Philly, they root for their team. Dallas, they root for their teams. Because New York is so big and you have two or three of every team, the Knicks are really the only team that can kind of unify the entire city. And since they've been bad for so long and they're finally relevant, that's why people are going crazy. So. That's why you're seeing the the passion uh, for this Nick fan base right now. But 
you know, for me personally, I couldn't root for any other New York team that isn't the teams I root for. Hey, I really appreciate that. I'm kind of a diehard as well. One team only in every single sport. Jake Asman of ESPN New York. Jake Asman Show on YouTube. Mad Dog Sports Radio is our guest here. Monday edition of Overtime. Takeaways from the NFL draft from a Jets perspective, my friend. I know it wasn't an exciting or sexy first round pick. A lot of people would have loved to see another pass catcher there. Brock Bowers, maybe. You guys get the tackle uh, from Penn State in round one. Big takeaways from start to finish from a Jets perspective in the NFL draft. The Jets, in my opinion, just operated like a smart franchise. I'm not going to sit here and tell you I've watched every rep of Olu Fashion to a Penn State and be like, yep, he's going to be a star tackle. But people you talk to, people who do it for a living, say he was thought to be maybe the best just pure pass protector coming out. Maybe he could get a little better as a run blocker. That might be the one knock on him. But as far as pass protection goes, he's someone that right away could be a plug-and-play tackle for you. And I think what makes the Jets situation unique is he doesn't need to play right away. So we get the chance to learn behind a future Hall of Fame player and Tyron Smith and a, a really good Iron Man type player and Morgan Moses at right tackle. He'll be the Jets' swing tackle from day one. But you look at Tyron Smith's injury history, the last time he played a full season, Ryan Fitzpatrick was the Jet quarterback. So it's been a long time. So you know, Tyron Smith last year was second team all pro. He played 13 games. Every Jet fan would sign for that right now. But the reality is he's missed so much time that bringing in a guy like Olu Fashanu, it it helps your future because he's your long-term answer at left tackle, but it also raises your floor because I think when you look at the Jets and you talk about things that could go wrong, the thing that really could derail their season besides Aaron Rodgers getting hurt is all the O-line injuries from last year, and that also could lead to Aaron Rodgers getting hurt again. So just providing some real insurance there with Fashanu, to me, made a ton of sense. Premium position, which means he's on a, a rookie deal for the next five years. So when you've got to pay a year from now, Sauce Gardner, Garrett Wilson, Brees Hall, Jermaine Johnson, Elijah Barrett Tucker, all these guys that are up for new deals. Well, if you're not paying your left tackle a lot of money, that helps you keep those guys. So I think it was a smart pick for the immediate and the future as well. And then I really love what they did day two of the draft. They traded up with some of the extra capital they gained in their trade down to move back just one spot with the Vikings who wanted to get a quarterback. And they turned that into Malachi Corley, who they had on their board as a top 50 player. And He's someone that I think right away will come in and contribute in the slot in this offense. You know, he's nicknamed the Yak King for a reason. A lot of Jet fans maybe wanted Brock Bowers because of his prowess after the catch. Well, Malachi Corley essentially is Brock Bowers' light. So I think Rodgers was pumped with that selection, and I think he's going to play a real role on this team. So I love what they did with their first two picks. And then day three, you know, you're just taking dark throws. You're trying to find some talent. They took a couple of running backs. They took a guy in, in Quantes Stiggers who's got a lot of talent. He's very interesting backstory. You know, he was in the CFL and was rookie of the year there. And now he's you know going to get a chance to play in an elite, you know, secondary room led by sauce Gardner. So it was interesting what they did. And then, you know, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention, you know, they took a, they took a dart throw on a day three quarterback in Jordan Travis from Florida state. So, you know, maybe one day he's the heir apparent to Rogers, but if he ends up just being a backup, that costs you very little money. That's a pretty good uh, asset, you know, asset management for a fifth round guy. So overall, it wasn't maybe the sexiest draft as you brought up, but I think they accomplished a lot, and it was a productive draft for the Jets. Jake, what was your favorite pick from the Jets' perspective? Because, of course, you go offensive lineman round one. That could be your favorite pick. But is it Corley that kind of moves the needle the most for you as a fan and as an analyst, or is it somebody else? Corley, to me, would be my favorite pick because I, the more I watch his film, the more I see, like, wow, like I can tell why they really like this guy. I guess maybe his route running needs to be a little polished, but there's just space just to get the guy the ball and let him go. And that was such an issue for the Jets last year. Obviously, the quarterback play stunk, but outside of Garrett Wilson, there was no one in that receiver room you trusted with the ball in their hands. Alan Lazard was a major disappointment. He was a healthy scratch for three of their games by the end of the season. And if you look at what they've done this offseason, they added Mike Williams. He could play outside and inside. He compliments Garrett Wilson really well. And I think Corley is a guy who, who will step in right away he already is talking about living in Aaron Rodgers' guest house and developing <laughs> chemistry with him. So I think every Jet fan's really excited to see what he can do. Plus, if your nickname is the Yak King or the Yak God, uh, you're going to excite a fan base. So that's my personal favorite pick they made. And a comp for me for Corley that I watched a little bit on film and a guy that I loved when he was with the Packers was with Rodgers. James Jones was that dude that wasn't fast, wasn't big, wasn't a great route runner. But when he had the ball in his hands, he would move it roughly like a 5 5 40 pace just through the defense, weaving and bobbing through. James Jones could be a good comp moving forward for Malachi Corley in New York. Jake Asman, our guest here. The AFC as it sits right now, there's still a whale of an offseason remaining, including a lot of free agents out there. But Chiefs and Ravens, probably the top two teams. Who else do you put in that conversation, and how far back are the Jets as we sit here today? 
I mean, if you just look at the talent the Jets have and you assume health, which you can, I think they're as talented as really any team. But you put the Chiefs in their own category, I think they've earned that, you know, based on the three Super Bowls in five years and all that. But, you know, a year ago at this time, I don't remember anyone talking about the Ravens as the, the one seed in the East. A year ago, you look at Miami, all the talk with them was, well, you know, is Tua going to stay healthy? And ironically, both Lamar and Tua were like two of the only quarterbacks that actually played every game. So, you know, I say that to say the NFL is such a year-to-year league. Five of the eight teams that were in the divisional round this year weren't in the playoffs. A year ago. So, you know, if the Jets get health, I think they're right there with any team. I still think you got to respect Cincinnati if Burrow's healthy. I still think when you look around at, you know, the, the, the upper echelon teams, as long as Josh Allen is the Bills quarterback, even without Stephon Diggs, they gonna, they're going to be in the mix. But I, I really do think when you look at the top of the AFC, find me a team that has as much talent, at least on paper, than the Jets do. The key is going to be Aaron Rodgers being healthy and still proving. You know, he's a top 10 quarterback in the league, but you tell me he plays, let's say, 15 of 17 games, and Tyrod Taylor is there playing the other two. There's no reason why the Jets can't compete in the AFC East for sure. Interesting stuff. The New York Jets, the Cincinnati Bengals, a pair of teams that didn't make the playoffs last year that are definitely likely to do so this year. Last question before we let you go, Jake. Always appreciate the time and the insight. Here's your seven playoff teams from last year in the AFC. Baltimore, Buffalo, Kansas City, Houston, Cleveland, Miami, and Pittsburgh. Take the two teams out that you think the Bengals and the Jets are taking the place of. Who falls out of the playoffs in 2024? Man, it, you know, it, it would be easy for me just to say ah, uh, Pittsburgh. But, man, it's like Mike Tomlin every year finds a way to get them in and keep them relevant. So it's tough for me to say that. I mean, I, I'm really not as high. Maybe I'll be called a hater because I have a Jets fan. But I'm not as high on the Dolphins as maybe some are. Yeah. You know, I think they were fraudulent at times last year. I think we saw, you know, down the stretch who they really were. I mean, two has never won a game in his career when the temperature is below 45 degrees. They had a, a one in five record against teams with a, a winning record a season ago. So I, I'm just not sold on the Dolphins. Like maybe some are. I know Tua was healthy last year, but could we see him be healthy again for another full year? I don't know if that's fair to say, but every time I talk about the Jets, people are like, oh, well, Aaron's going to get hurt. And it's like, <laughs> well, he never, he never really had an injury history until a fluke accident last year on the fourth play of the season. So I, I, I just don't think Miami is nearly as good as some people think. I think they got some major O-line questions. They lost Robert Hunt in free agency to the Panthers. Christian Wilkins signed elsewhere with the Raiders. So, you know, they, they were up against the cap. They couldn't keep everyone. And, you know, they're, they're about to probably have to pay Tua a lot of money. And I think Tua is a good quarterback. I don't think he's a championship quarterback. So I have some questions about Miami, but I know Teddy Dolphin fan, I'm just going to be accused of being a hater. So it is what it is. Hey, I'm on board with the Dolphins falling out of the postseason. I think the Bills take a step back. I don't know if they fall all the way out, but always appreciate the insight. We'll have time to debate that all over the next four months or so. Jake, appreciate the time as always. We'll do it again soon, my friend. Bert, anytime. Thank you so much for having me. All right. Always a blast to talk with Jake Asman. Always check out that show, by the way, the Jake Asman Show on YouTube. Even if you're not a Jets fan, which I am not, Compelling content, engaging fans, all sorts of great questions, and everything you want as a sports fan. The Jake Asman Show on YouTube. Also a contributor at Mad Dog Sports Radio and on the ESPN flagship out there in New York. That is ESPN New York. We take the break and come back with a super fast segment to round out our number one. We'll give you the latest odds for the NBA tonight and moving forward. And talk Timberwolves coming up next on Overtime. Streaming live online and with the app, this is Overtime with Bert Ramin on ESPN 102.3 and AM 1000 KSOO, Sioux Falls Sports Leader. Right back with you, it's hour number one, technically hour number two of Overtime. Get you your headlines and highlights here shortly. Latest from the NBA quickly on the way to their NBA championship last season. The Nuggets were also widely renowned for having arguably the best starting five in basketball. Minnesota Timberwolves coach Chris Finch said much said as much before the team's game one win on Saturday, calling the Nuggets' first unit probably the most complete and complimentary starting five in the league, but Denver starters haven't been getting off to great starts this postseason, and Nuggets coach Michael Malone said that needs to change. We have to do a better job. Our starters in particular have to do a better job of being ready to play and setting the tone early. Malone said after the Nuggets film session on Sunday, what are we waiting for? I mean, now we're down 0-1. What are you waiting for? The Denver Nuggets still likely in most people's eyes to advance beyond the Minnesota Timberwolves in this series. The Western Conference 7 
semifinals, but some interesting odds to share with you. First things first, game one tonight, Pacers and Knicks. Indiana is a five and a half point road dog there, over under set at 217 and a half. It's another anticipated defensive slugfest between Minnesota and Denver. 206 and a half is the score total over under at DraftKings Sportsbook, and the spread remains the same what it was last week or on, uh, last week during the middle of the week for the Saturday series opener. Minnesota plus five and a half. That is subject to change, but right now that is where it's at. Minnesota five and a half point dog at Denver for game two. And moving forward, by the way, I'm going to push back and I don't mean to ignite the flames of uh, the fandom of the Minnesota Timberwolves. But get a load of this because the series prop, uh, the overall uh, series spread for the uh, the series between Minnesota and Denver the Minnesota Timberwolves are favored to win the series. Do you think that's right? I personally think it's a little bit too early to say that. Denver is plus 105, Minnesota minus 125. But as I said on the jump today off the start of the show, if Minnesota finds a way to win tonight, just to win, Tonight, I think that the entire narrative of the NBA, the best teams in the league, who's going to win it all is going to come bursting at the seams. I think it'll be a Minnesota frenzy if the Timberwolves can pull it off again tonight in Denver. Five and a half point dogs, but Minnesota right now is actually favored to win the series, according to DraftKings Sportsbook, minus 125. The Nuggets, plus 105. Other series favorites, the Knicks, minus 245 over the Pacers. The Celtics, minus 1,200 against the Cavs. And the Thunder, narrow favorite, minus 115 against Dallas at minus 105. That is the latest from the NBA. We take the break back with your headlines, highlights, and more right here on Overtime. 